here we are. And we are going to be talking about being trapped. And what are we saying about being trapped? Okay, in Luke 17, verse 1, Jesus said to his disciples something that is amazing. It's um, something so profound, so true. He said, it is impossible for offenses not to come. And if you read the description in different versions, it's, um, some versions says it is impossible that, um, that not, the, the English, it kind of confuses me because they're like two negatives and then they make like one positive. It's impossible but offenses to come and it's like, huh? Okay, other scriptures say offenses will certainly come. Or offenses are bound to happen. <laughs> okay, so I think we get the message, right? That offenses are going to be around us. They're going to happen. They're going to be every time, everywhere, from anyone. And different versions, instead of using the, the word offense, they use the word trap or uh, a bait stick or something that causes you to stumble, or something that causes you to sin. And actually, I need my assistant. Please, um, I have some, a little prop right here. Thank you, Ivan. And um, the reason why we're calling this message trap, it's because if you are familiar with a trap for an animal, hold on, let's see. It worked in my office, so it better work. Okay, so this is a trap, okay? Just picture this being a real cage without holes because there's no purpose of trapping something if we have holes. But let's use our imagination. And this is a cage that it's ready to trap an, an animal. And here comes the cute little bird and wants the seed that it's inside, but the moment that the bird comes in, what happens? It gets trapped. Now, something very interesting in this scripture in Luke 17, 1, where Jesus says, it is impossible that offenses come, is that this word offense in the Bible, it's the word stick trap. This is the Greek word scandalo, and it means literally a stick trap. It means a removable stick or trigger for a trap. So this, the Bible calls it an offense. And what is an offense? An offense, it's something that is going to cause you to be trapped. So I think that this is so important for us to know that offenses are not something to brag about, you know, our culture. It's so funny, our culture promotes being offended as if it was a virtue. Like, one day suddenly, we're supposed to be offended by everything. And, and you're supposed to be proud to be offended. And actually, the Bible tells us that being offended, it's being trapped. And trapped, what type of trap? Okay, so... When, when we are offended, we are trapped uh, for, by the enemy to live a life of misery, to live a life of bitterness and unforgiveness. And just, you know, just to be clear, we all have been offended. Yes? Have you been offended? I mean, if we are honest, everything and everywhere can throw an offense in your life. And if we want to, we can be offended by everything. Like right now, choose something to be offended. We all can do that, right? But what we need to realize, what, what God wants to show us in the scripture is that we don't want to be offended. The reason why Jesus is warning us that there's going to be offenses everywhere. Like you can be offended uh, that I'm here tonight and, and not me, Sasha, or Pastor Sasha. You can be offended by, um, by the picture that they choose. Why did they choose a little cute bird, you know? You can be offended by the colors. We, you can be offended by everything, right? You know what's something, and something interesting, that you can be offended 
by uh, your closest uh, friends, family, the people that you love, they can offend you if you choose to be offended. So everybody, say with me, everybody can offend you. Everywhere, say with me, everywhere. Everywhere you can be offended. And everything, say with me, everything, everything can offend you if you choose to. If you choose to, to allow to, uh, yourself to be offended. But what happens when we get offended? We get trapped. We are trapped. There's a scripture in, uh, in 2 Timothy 2.26. I'm going to read it from the uh, Passion Translation. And this is like the last scripture in this chapter. But the whole context of this scripture, it's saying that, that servants of God need to help people know the truth and realize the truth. So, uh, so people... I'm reading you the scripture. It says, this will cause them, the people that need to know the truth, to rediscover themselves and escape from the snare of Satan who caught them in his trap so that they would carry out his purpose. I mean, this is a, a scary scripture. This scripture tells us that when we are snare of Satan, we are caught, we are trapped, and because we are trapped, we are going to end up carrying out his purposes. Is that scary or what? That when we are trapped by the enemy, without us even knowing, you know, unconsciously, just because if you're offended, you're going to be operating on bitterness, unforgiveness, and ultimately you're going to be you're going to be used by the, by the enemy to cause division, to hurt other people, to, to poison. The scripture says that, that we can poison people with our bitterness. So this is, this is something very serious that a lot of people don't know the importance of being aware of, of, about offenses and actually try to avoid them. So now that we know that offenses are going to come from everywhere, from anyone, every, every, all, all the time, we can choose. There's a difference from offenses uh, to come and for me to be offended. The reason that, I mean, the fact that the offenses are going to come my way doesn't mean that I have to be offended. And these are great news, okay? So it's not like you're, you're um, in, in defensive uh, against offenses. You have a choice, you have a choice. And actually, there's a scripture in Proverbs 19.11, again from the Passion Translation. It says, a wise person demonstrates patience, for mercy means holding your tongue. <laughs> okay, so wise people, just hold your tongue. And then it says, when you are insulted, be quick to forgive and forget it. For you are virtuous when you overlook an offense. So these are great news. One thing we, we have learned is that offenses are going to bombard you all the time. Whenever, uh, when you least expect it, they're going to come. From people that you least expect it, they're going to come. But some good news is that you can overlook the offenses. You don't have to fall in the trap. You don't have to get stumbled with this little stick and get trapped. You don't have to. And these are great news. So what happens when we get trapped? The main thing that happens is that we become victims. We start operating with a victim mentality. And if you believe that you are a victim, you're going to see yourself powerless. And because you're a victim, then you're going to start justifying your behavior. Because you believe that, that you're the innocent part, so whatever you're doing, it's right because you are right. And then you become a victim, you start justifying your behavior, you're, you're going to start rehearsing your story over and over and over in your mind. Have you ever done that? Have you ever received an offense? Be honest, I know you have. I have. And what happens? We start repeating the whole story to ourselves in our minds, and then it's not going to stay here. We're going to, uh, you know, start telling everybody 
what they what they said about us, how they look. They didn't look. They didn't call. Why they call? Um, we're going to tell everybody why we are offended. And this, the Bible says this is kind of like poisoning people. Then we're going to start blaming others, and we're going to ultimately open our lives to a life of bitterness, unforgiveness, and just plain up misery. And we don't want that, right? Now, when we have, to, uh, when it has to do with with people being offended, not us. We're, we're not talking about us tonight. You know, those people, those people that are offended. Okay, when people are offended, we can categorize people into groups. Group number one is those people that are offended because they have suffered an injustice. So something wrong happened to them. They were 100% innocent. They, they, they were wronged. And then these people have an opportunity to be offended. And then there's another group, the group that are offended, but these people really haven't received any injustice. They just feel like they have received an injustice. They believe, they, they, they feel like, like they, they, somebody offended, but actually it hasn't happened. They just twisted some conclusions. They just had some misinformation, misunderstanding, and we both have been in both groups, right? We've been in the groups where something happened to you they were rude, or they were mean, or they took advantage of you, whatever you want to call it, and, and you have an opportunity to be offended. And actually, sometimes we get offended. And if we tell our friends what happens, even our friends says, you have all the right to be, to be mad. You have all the right to be offended. Have you ever said that? I mean, I think I have said it, and I think I've said, I, I've been wanted to say it sometimes. I've said, you have all the right to be mad. Yes, it's justifiable. I'm with you. Because what? Something wrong happened to you. But then the other group, they believe that something wrong happened to you when, uh, when actually nothing has happened. So in the first group, um, there's, there's a story in the Bible of somebody that fits in this first group. Actually, it doesn't really fit, but it could fit if he wanted to. And this is the story of Joseph. If you know anything about Joseph, Joseph, um, okay, just a little context. Have you ever heard about the tribes of Israel? Some of you, yes? One hand. Okay, we need to give you a class on the Old Testament. Do you know the people of Israel? <laughs> okay, um, you guys are good students. History, world uh, knowledge. Okay, so there's this place called Israel, right? And this place called Israel started by a guy named Jacob, and God changed his name to Israel. And this guy had 12, God, 12 sons, and each one of these sons became what they're, what they're uh, known as the tribes of Israel. And these 12 sons, as they grew and multiplied, they became the nation of Israel. Wow, world knowledge tonight. Okay, so one of these brothers, out of those 12 brothers, one of these brothers, uh, his name is Joseph. And Joseph, he is a cool guy. I mean, Joseph has all my respect, my admiration. Joseph is amazing. So Joseph, the Bible starts telling us about his life when he was 17 years old. He's 17 years old. Any 17 years old here? Okay, I have, sure, by faith in Jesus' name, <laughs> claiming our youthness. My youth is renewed as the eagle. Okay, so any 17-year-old, any 17 wannabe? Okay, 18, 16. Okay, so just stand up. Um, Tristan and Luis, and who else was 17 or around 17? Daniel, stand up, you're 16. So we have, we have a 17, 18, 16, yeah, is, is that right? Okay, just picture a Joseph in, in them, okay? Thank you so much, you, you can sit down. So picture one of these guys, loved by, by their dad, by their mom, 
They have their whole future in front of them. They love God. They have dreams. They have God's favor, God's blessings. And guess what? Joseph, because he was one of his favors by his dad, parenting, teaching, don't show too, many, uh, too much favoritism for one kid because you can cause division. So anyways, one of the reasons why, um, why Joseph had issues with his brothers is because they were not from the same mom. Another, uh, not, this is now a marriage uh, teaching, okay? Just, just wisdom all over the Bible. Okay, so, so Joseph, he's the favor of the dad. And the Bible says that because he was his, the favor of the dad, and he has dreams and he has visions and God has an, a calling in his life, he, uh, he just doesn't fit with his brothers. The brothers can't stand him. The brothers not just don't like him. The brothers hate him. The brothers want to get rid of him. And they decide to kill him. Let's just kill Joseph because I can't stand him. They were offended. And then... Um, then they're like, you know what, if we kill him, that, that's not very profitable. Let's just sell him as a slave. So let's just make some money and get rid of him. It's a win-win. Okay, so they sell Joseph, 17 years old. He, he's the dad's favor, and Joseph lives in Canaan. They sell him, they take him to Egypt. And now Joseph, it's a slave in another country, a country where he doesn't know anything, he doesn't know the language, he has to learn the language, he has to learn to survive for himself. And, um, and there's no hope that the dad would rescue him because the dad believes that Joseph is dead. So now Joseph, 17 years old, he doesn't have a young adult service, he doesn't have a pastor, he doesn't have a Bible, he doesn't have his phone, his social media. He's on his own. He's a slave. How many of you will put Joseph right here in this group and say, Joseph, you have suffered an injustice. And if you want to be offended, Joseph, you have all the right to be offended. Is that true? Yes? Okay. We would all agree with him. We would be offended with him. That is wrong. Those brothers. But what happened? Joseph chooses to get away from this group. And he chooses not to be offended. I mean, what an opportunity to get mad at your brothers, to hate your brothers, to, to even be mad at God. Because God, how do you allow this to happen to me? Like, this is not fair. Talk about fairness, right? So Joseph decides that, that he's going to live a life of integrity, of character. He's going to serve. He's going to operate in excellence. He's going to acknowledge God in all his ways. And he's going to cultivate his relationship with God. And you know what happens? He is uh, he's promoted as a slave. He, he was a great slave. He was a, a great a, administrator, and he, he, liked, he had some leadership skills, so he started to prosper. And then, in, uh, while, while he's prospering, being a slave, he has an, an issue with, with the wife of his boss, and, and she lies about him, and then the boss gets mad at him. He throws him in prison, and Joseph now... Not only he's a slave, now he is a slave in prison. And again, he has now double reason to be in this group, to be offended, to be bitter, to have unforgiveness in his heart. Is that right? Is that true? Yes? So, but what happened? Joseph chooses to not be offended. And he chooses to, to keep his heart correct before God. He chooses to keep his heart clean. And then you're thinking like this happened, you know, the next year. No, we are talking now 11 years after. 11 years since he was sold. He's in prison. We don't know how many years he's in prison. And one day in prison, he's taking care of these guys that work for the king, for, for Pharaoh. And one of them was uh, the cup bearer, bearer the guy that 
poured the wine, uh, the, the wine for, the, for Pharaoh. And another one was the, the baker. And then you, you need to watch the vegetables version of Joseph because it's like epic. Like, like you, if, if there's a movie that you want to watch. And then The Prince of Egypt, that's one of my favorites too. So, um, so now Joseph, he's in prison. And these guys, this amazes me. The Bible says that these guys were sad one morning. They woke up and they were just low. And Joseph, the prisoner slave, comes and encourages them. <laughs> You're like, wow, he's amazing. So he's like, hey, guys, why are you down? Let me help you. What can I do for you? And they're like, well, we had these weird dreams last night, and we don't know if it was the pizza or the pozole or, or what, what's up with these dreams. And Joseph, he's like, okay, let me help you. God knows how to... Um, interpret dreams so, so I can help you. So they tell him the dream, and he's like, okay, so you are going to be released and go back to work uh, at the palace, and you, sorry, you're, you're going to die. So, so, so the guy that, that is going to go back to the palace, he's like, hey, when you're at the palace, please uh, talk to Pharaoh about me because tell him that I, I, I do not belong here. Something wrong happened, and I'm innocent, and, and I was kidnapped by my, my brothers. And, and the guy said, yeah, 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 okay, sure. Uh, this guy leaves prison two years after. Totally forgot about Joseph. And one day, Pharaoh wakes up and has these weird dreams. And if you know the vegetal version, it's so funny. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but... But it's kind of like, no, I'm not going to tell you. You have to see that. It's so funny. But uh, so, so Pharaoh has these dreams. And then um, the, the cup bearer, he's like, oh, I know somebody that, that interprets dreams. Oh, my gosh, I forgot. Joseph, yeah, two years later. <laughs> okay, so they called Joseph out of prison. He comes and... And Joseph interprets the dream of Pharaoh. And then Pharaoh is like, Joseph, you're amazing. God's wind wisdom is all over you. And I'm going to have you be my second in command. Now, Joseph is finally fulfilling the purpose, the destiny that God, was, uh, that God had for him. But we're talking like he was 30 years old when, when he finally came out of prison and start fulfill, fulfilling his destiny. But actually, he was fulfilling his destiny every single day. Why? Because he chose not to be offended. And then uh, the story continues. It says that, that there was famine, uh, th th there was lack and, and no food in, in the land. And then his brothers came to, to Egypt to buy grain because he's a, a good businessman. And they didn't recognize him. He disguised as a pharaoh. And then he finally um, reveals, and he's like, hey, it's me. I'm alive. And, and the brothers, they're like, oh, no, he's going to kill us. <laughs> they're, they're talking the, the version right here. <laughs> and um, so Joseph says something amazing. Joseph tells his brothers, it says, don't be scared now that I am in power and that you have to bow to me, huh? Um, he's like, don't be, don't be afraid. I'm not going to retaliate. I'm not going to seek vengeance. He's like, in Genesis 50, 20, it says, you intend harm to me, but God intended, intended it all for good. He brought me here to this position so I could save the lives of many people. So this is amazing that Joseph, no matter everything that happened to him, and he had all the right to be offended. Like if somebody can be offended, he should be offended. He had all the facts. He chose to guard his heart. He chose to forgive. He chose to see the bigger picture, and he chose not to have bitterness and unforgiveness in his life. He chose to guard his heart and to cultivate his relationship with God, 
and he was able to prosper and prosper. And no matter what came against him, he moved on and moved on, and God fulfilled his purpose in his life. And you know what tells us? It tells us that nothing and nobody can take you out of God's plan for your life. Only you. And this is why the enemy wants you to be trapped. Because once that you are trapped, you are being robbed from fulfilling God's destiny in your life. But this is why Jesus at advise us and, and warns us, hey, watch out because offenses are going to come in your life. Now, so the cure for this group, if you are offended, if you have been offended, if you, next time you are offended, when, whenever you're in this category that something bad happens to you, somebody wronged you, and injustice happened to you, you need to get out this group as soon as you can. And how do you get out? You forgive. Amen? You forgive. You release. Uh, the Bible says that we need to release unforgiveness, that we need to release the person that, that, that wronged us. Then what happens with the second group? In this second group, there are people that are offended, but they, they, have, they haven't experienced an injustice. They just believe like they have. They feel like. They perceive. They imagine. They're, they're just assuming. Do you understand the difference, right? And you know what? Sadly, our culture, as, as we mentioned before, it promotes for you to be offended. Our culture is telling us that we should be offended for everything. I mean, you should be offended for, um, for your color. You should be offended for, for your race, you should be offended for your gender or for your, um, for your work or whatever reason, the world, uh, the enemy system wants us to be offended, wants us to, to be all the time feeling like there's these people attacking me, oppressing me, and I am a victim. And yes, we know that there are there are injustices in this world. We're, we're not going to deny that. But that doesn't mean that we all are experiencing injustice, right? But the world system wants us to believe that we are all experiencing all this injustice, and therefore we should be offended. And then um, the people that, that are in this category, they believe it with all their heart that they have been wrong. So they, they get conclusions from inaccurate information, they twist conclusions, they, they get misunderstanding, and then ultimately they get deceived. And once that they're deceived, they start to operate in, in bitterness and unforgiveness. And when you do that, you are, you're living a life trapped by the enemy. There are there are three main reasons why we can fall in this category and feel like, like we have been offended, actually like we have been wrong, and therefore I have the right to be offended. And the reason number one why it's easy to be part of this group is if you have a blaming mentality, okay? And here I feel like, all of us are going to be like, ouch, because, because we all have been in this group too. I mean, there has been reasons like um, with text. Text is amazing opportunity to be offended because if somebody uh, put something wrong or um, I remember this, uh, this time, Pastor, I sent Pastor a text and then he replied to me kind of like, blah. And I was like, hmm, that was weird. And then I'm like, okay. And then when he came home, I'm like, hey, why did you reply this way? And he's like, well, that's because you said whatever. And I'm like, I did not say that. He's like, yes, you did. So we both get our phone. We read, we read it. And he's like, oh, you didn't. Okay, never mind. And the same thing has happened, you know, in, in my case. Sometimes um, I'm like, 
say that? And, and I'm like, hey, why did you say that? He's like, I didn't say that. I'm like, yes, you did. And he's like, no, I didn't. I'm like, you said this is, the, and he's like, no, I said this and that. I'm like, oh, never mind. Okay, so, I mean, so easy. We have opportunities to be offended. And with text, it's like amazing. Like, watch out with text. Because some, you know, especially autocorrect can get you in a lot of trouble. Or have you ever texted somebody that, that it was for somebody else, but you send it to the wrong person, and you're like, oh, sorry, sorry, that wasn't supposed to happen. Okay, so blaming. We can blame our phone, but actually blaming, it's a real issue in our lives. And blaming, if you blame your parents, have you ever blamed your parents? Daniel, don't raise your hand. Matthew, I'm watching you. Um, have you ever blamed your parents for something, whatever? Okay, they can blame me sometimes. If they get late, yeah, they can blame their mom sometimes. Um, sometimes we blame our parents for where we are, for what we have, for what we don't have. Have you been there? I've been there. Like, my parents, if my mom, if my dad, okay. We can blame our parents. How about our government? Have you ever blamed your government? Yeah, nobody's sure. Okay. Um, have you ever blamed church? Yeah, you, you can blame church. We can blame everybody. We can blame different situations. But if we blame somebody or something or an organization for where we are, then we are living as a victim we are living with a victim mentality. In other worlds, in, in, in other word, uh, words, you, you're saying that, that you have no choice because these people have control over your life. And that is not true. And if you blame other people, then you are going to live a life being angry. Because if you see yourself as a victim, you are going to be angry all the time. And, and I think you can see some patterns of people that, that they feel like they're victims, and you cannot be a happy victim. You, you're going to be angry because stuff has been stealing from you. Your life, your, your, your rights, uh, your hope, your future. If you blame people, you're going to become somebody unthankful. If you blame your parents for whoever you turn out to be, guess what? You are not going to be able to value what they did for you or what they tried to, to do for you. And it's so easy to blame, 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 and then you cannot be thankful for what you have or who you are because you're just blaming. And ultimately, you are going to be unhappy. So if you blame people you are going to end up being somebody very unhappy. Unhappy, angry, nobody wants to be that, right? Then um, there's another reason why it, it's so easy for us to be offended when something hasn't really happened to us, like when there's no wrong, but we still feel offended. And this is the entitlement mindset. And the entitlement mindset is that I deserve, I, I, I deserve special treatment, I deserve everything, and therefore, if something doesn't happen, then I am going to throw a fit and I'm going to be offended. Because I believe that, that I'm this special person that deserves all these special things to happen to me. And, um, and somebody that, that deals with that entitlement mentality believes also that they are exempt from responsibility. In other words, in other words have, you, have you ever known people like this that, that they get offended for everything you do? So you're responsible for everything you do, but they have no responsibility for what they do? Like, I can do whatever I want. I have no responsibility, but I'm going to be offended if you act this way towards me, if you say these words for me, towards me. So they're like, I'm not responsible for how I affect you, but you are responsible for how you're affecting me. That's an entitlement mindset. And 
with this mindset, you are going to, again, end up offended and, and bitter and angry and unhappy. And then one other reason. Daniel, do we have the graphic? Okay, I'm going to show this. Oh, that's a very cool graphic, Daniel. So another reason why we can fall in this category group so easily has to do with your worldview. Say with me, worldview. Okay, what is a worldview? A worldview, we're going to use it in a minute, okay? A worldview is the way you see life. It's the, way, it's the way you process life, and it has to do with, your, uh, with the filters on how you see life. And in our culture, we are, um, we're, we're, we're being um, brainwashed and, and, and promoted this worldview where we should be offended because we are victims of pretty much everything that we don't like, then it offends me. And, um, and, and there's, there's these mean people, there's these oppressors that want, want to steal our happiness and our joy, and, and, and there's just mean people, and, and we're victims. But this, uh, this type of worldviews are, first of all, they, they don't make sense, okay? So there's a, the, the Bible shows us a worldview. And again, the way you see everything, the way you process life, it's going to help you to get out of this group of people because you're going to realize that, no, you're not a victim, that, no, you don't have reasons to, to be offended. So let's, let's check our picture, please. So in this picture, this is the, the uh, biblical or Christianity, you know, this is the worldview according to Bible and Christianity. And this worldview tells us who we are and why we are here. So how do we start? We start God loving us and creating us for a purpose because God wants relationship with us. But if you don't have this worldview, then you're going to start with not even having purpose. You just be, uh, came here from an amoeba or a monkey. So it, it just starts wrong, right? Then what is the fundamental problem as humans? What's the big problem that I have and you have and our world, uh, world around has? The main problem, the fundamental problem, it's not politics. It's not different parties. It's not um, your color. It's not your race. It's not how much money you have. It's not um, communism or socialism or capitalism. The main problem is called sin, the fall of men. So when you see life that, okay, what's the big problem in life? And you recognize the big problem is that all men have sin, and we are now separated from God. What is the solution? So the solution for the problems that everybody deals with, the solution is not to become an activist or to have protests. Or, and I'm not saying that the protests are, are, are bad. I mean, maybe there's a reason why. Um, the, the, the solution is no... To, to change this or to do that, or the solution is not um, the solution, it's called Jesus, right? So the only thing that is going to change a human heart is called a new birth, a new birth in Jesus. Receiving Jesus' salvation and grace and forgiveness in our lives, that's the only thing that is going to change our world. So if, if you don't know this worldview, you're going to live very frustrated in life, and you're going to be offended at what happens around you and, and frustrated because there's no solutions and the world is getting worse, and, and, and what are we going to do? And, and you're going to spend your wheels trying to fix something or, or being hurt, being defensive, when the real reason is that people need Jesus. 
people need to be free from their sin nature. People need to, uh, to uh, be safe, born again, and experience a new life in God. Amen? And then the last part is restoration. So what, uh, what are we supposed to do once that we receive this redemption? Restoration. In our lives, this is us. Once that we have received Jesus, now we can be restored in our emotions, in our social life, in our physical life, in our spiritual life. And ultimately, we have a hope that with God, we are going to have this ultimate restoration in all ways imaginable. Complete restoration in our physical body. Complete restoration in our emotions. Complete restoration in our spirit. Do you believe this? Do you know this? Okay. So when we, when we have the right, when we have the wrong worldview, it's going to be so easy for us to be part of the second group where we are living offended lives for no reason, for no reason. And we are allowing the enemy to trap us and to rob us from our life, from our joy, from our hope, from our future, from our dreams. Why? Because we're mad. We're offended. Things are wrong, and, and we have to blame people, and I deserve this, and nothing is happening for me. And, and God says, no, 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 no. Change your mind because the problem is not what's happening around you or the problem is not what's not happening in your life. So how do we overcome this mindset of entitlement and blaming? It's called responsibility. Take responsibility. Next time, instead of saying, I deserve I deserve to be happy. Say, I am responsible for being happy. Instead of saying, I deserve um, a better job. Say, I am responsible to get a better job. Next time and say, I deserve to have a better uh, car. I am responsible to get me a better car. And that is going to help you to... Uh, to get free from blaming people, from taking, uh, for, from having this entitlement mindset. So your success, it's your responsibility. Joseph took responsibility of his life. He could have blamed people. He could have blamed even God. He could uh, have this entitlement mindset and say, hey, I deserve this. I'm my dad's favor. But instead, he took responsibility. Amen? Say with me, responsibility. Good job. Responsibility. The Bible tells us that above all things, we need to guard our heart. So how do we guard our heart? We take responsibility. We cannot blame anybody. Yes, even if something bad happened to you. Yes, even if somebody comes and, and brings obstacles in your life. You have the choice to forgive and to take responsibility. And just as Joseph, no matter how many obstacles and no matter how, how, how long you think that it's taking, ultimately, nobody can take you away from God's plan for your life. Only you can do that. So, so let's just keep going. Let's keep going. Let's stay, stay faithful to God and Let's don't blame people. Let's don't, don't get offended. Let's don't live trapped lives. And, and we need to recognize that only, only I can, can guard my heart. Nobody can do it for me. And only you can guard your heart. Nobody can do it for you. So we, it's, it's our choice to decide if we are going to live free or if we're going to live trapped. And again, remember, offenses are going to come. The moment you get out of these doors, you're going to have an opportunity to be offended if you haven't had one already. But offenses may come. You don't have to be offended. Take responsibility. Guard your heart. Stick with God's plan. And no matter what comes against you, nobody can take you away from God's plan for your life.